And our next speaker today is Dr. Cheng Wa Gu from Harvard Medical School, and she'll be talking about brain vasculature at the neuroimmune interface. Cheng Wa. Great. Um, uh, thank Kathy and the team for putting together this wonderful meeting. Um, it's great to be here, um, be part of it. Um, so I'm going to return the topic of the brain. Oh, wrong button. Uh, I'm going to return um, this topic, um, of brain vasculature, we touched upon yesterday afternoon a little bit. Um, so this is a, a vascular cast of a human brain, just to give you a sense how, vas how densely vascularized our brain is. In fact, um, every neuron is less than 15 micron away from a capillary, and also we know the brain is a very expensive organ. Uh, even those that occupy only 2% of the body weight actually consume 20% of energy at rest, like right now you're listening to my talk, and with very limited uh, capability to store energy. Um, and also we know neurons in the brain are extraordinarily sensitive to their extracellular environment. So facing those unique challenges, um, the, the way to supplying the blood to the brain also very unique compared to the rest of the body in two ways. So first of all, um, to meet this moment-to-moment -moment demand of energy, uh, neural activation rapidly increased the local blood flow via the mechanism called neurovascular coupling. Secondly, the brain's uh, chemical milieu has to be tightly controlled. Um, this is achieved by the blood-brain barrier. So my lab studied the fundamental mechanisms underlying those two unique features of the brain vasculature and how they uh, regulate brain function. Uh, for today's talk, I'm only going. Whoa, I'm only going to tell you about the uh, blood-brain barrier uh, part of work. But before that, um, because this is more relevant to the project funded by the uh, Allen uh, Frontier Group, um, before that, I'm going to just show you one slide, uh, kind of a demonstrate the major type of a readout we use uh, to study the um, neurovascular coupling. And this is also relevant because, uh, as Tony mentioned yesterday, I'm also part of his team for the AHA uh, Frontier uh, Study uh, Aging. Um, so, um, so for neurovascular coupling, the way we study it is to um, uh, study this in vivo in awake mice. So I'm going to show you a movie. Um, so here it's a mouse um, uh, awake, you know, running on the ball. And there's a foam to touch the whisker. Um, so, and then um, we have a cranial window under the uh, two photon. So you can see this is the window of the um, barrel cortex. Uh, upon the whisker stimulation, you see a rapid increase in neural activity indicated by the GCAM. Uh, but I want to draw your attention, you probably saw this already, as an arterial wall, uh, you can clearly see the dilation immediately follow this um, uh, neuronal activation. So the whole process happened in vivo less than hundreds of milliseconds. So we're using uh, cell type specific genetic manipulation. Uh, together with this kind of imaging tools, uh, we're beginning to understand the mechanism underlying this process. Uh, we also have the capability to image the blood flow, uh, which I didn't show here. Um, so um, hopefully in the future, we'll have a chance to tell you about our work in this and also in the context of aging. Okay, so let's uh, come back to the blood brain barrier. So as a neuroscientist, we really appreciate the importance of the blood brain barrier. Um, it's a gatekeeper for the brain. It controls what's in and out of the brain and uh, protect the brain from the toxins, passengers, uh, and limited entry of the immune cells. Um, so here, just a, a cartoon version. There's a single layer of endothelial cells from the wall of the blood vessel and um, uh, astrocyte and feet hugging it and also parasite nearby. They all contribute to the overall uh, tightness of the barrier. Um, it's very important for normal function, but have a very tight barrier, also the biggest obstacle right now for delivering drugs to the uh, central nervous system to treat all kinds of uh, neurological diseases. On the other hand, um, so we wanted to be able to tightly, uh, to transiently open the barrier for the drug entry. On the other hand, um, recent work indicate that um, barrier also break down, precede the neurodegeneration. So in this case, perhaps we want to uh, able to tighten the barrier. 
So uh, either way, I think uh, if we can understand the basic mechanism um, underlying the blood barrier regulation, uh, we can really begin to do this manipulations for disease and repair. Um, so just a few words about the history of the blood barrier. Uh, so the concept of the blood barrier actually rise in the early 1900. Uh, Paul Ehrlich and his students, uh, they did a very simple experiment. They basically inject a water-soluble blue dye into the tail vein of the mouse and let it running around for some time, and then they just dissect all the organs out. Something was really astonishing that um, all the organs turn blue except the brain and the spinal cord. So of course, as many reasons could explain this, but one possibility they, they mentioned is that perhaps this indicate there's a physical barrier um, between the blood and the brain. So this concept to actually define where the location of the barrier took another 60 years until uh, Morris Konofsky and Tom Reese um, seminal work really in the 1960s uh, using EM. So in this case, they injected HRP, horse ratchet prosthesis, into the tail vein and let the rat mouse running for some time. And under the EM, uh, what they observe is that the um, HRP actually sharply uh, stopped at a tight junction between two neighboring endothelial cells. So this is a definitively, for the first time, localized the barrier is actually a property of endothelial cells. Prior to this, for many years, people thought it must be the end feed of the astrocyte. Um, I just want to draw your attention to, in the same animal, if you actually take, cut a piece of periphery uh, tissue and you notice that the um, tracers uh, can freely pass through the tight junction, stay in the basement membrane, um, clearly different from here. And uh, in addition, they also have a tracer containing vesicles in the endothelial cells, which you never see in the central nervous system endothelial cells. So because of this result, back then, uh, Morris and Tom concluded that um, this, there must be a very specialized type junctions um, account for this uh, incredibly um, tight blob and barrier. So give all the credit to this um, uh, specialized tight junctions. Um, so I wanted to, hopefully by the end of my talk, I'm going to convince you that, um, you know, those little, somehow the brain and the fetal cells also have the capability to actively suppress this to ensure the um, barrier integrity. So this is a, a, another mechanism. Okay, I just remember uh, a couple of years ago, you know, when I first saw those images, like star contract, it's really fascinating. Uh, so I was thinking there must be um, some kind of a unique genetic program uh, exist in the uh, central nervous system in the fetal cells compared to the periphery. And if we understand the, what are those genes, maybe we can begin to understand how the blood barrier works and function. Uh, so to do so, uh, we, um, we isolated um, in the fetal cells from the uh, brain, uh, have the barrier, and, and then also from the lung, um, have, the leak, you know, have a leaky blood vessel. Um, most of the genes are shared because they, at the end of the day, they're both endothelial cells, but we're particularly interested in those red uh, dotted genes. They're enriched in the um, brain endothelial cells and the very low expression in the lung. Um, so um, they're actually close to uh, 300 genes. Uh, and uh, today I'm just going to show you one of them. Uh, we studied in the past couple of years and we learned a great deal from, from that. Um, so um, this gene is called MFC2A. Um, it's a multi-transmembrane protein. So when you, um, so here is a typical assay we use. Um, we inject the tracer, fluorescence labeled, um, and you can see in the wild type case, the um, tracer is completely confined in the blood vessels. However, in the MFC2A mutant mice, you see the tracer leak out of the vessel, stay in the brain parenchyma. And we, uh, to our surprise, actually, this is not due to the opening of tight junctions. Uh, we did the exact same assay what uh, Morris and, and uh, Tom did. And you can see in both mutant and the wild type, the tracer still stop sharply at the tight junction, uh, indicating it's functionally normal. Uh, however, uh, when we look at um, transcytotic vesicles, uh, in the wild type, again, you, know, you don't see them. And uh, in the mutant, we we practically saw something we observed in the normally the periphery endothelial cells, right? So basically, lacking of the genes almost convert this to the 
periphery endothelial cell phenotype, uh, which is the um, um, trees are containing vesicle. So this is really exciting because this is for the first time made us realize that, um, you know, in addition to the specialized tight junctions um, preventing the paracellular tra uh, traffic from the uh, lumen to the brain, there is also a second mechanism that uh, it's not the brain in the fetal cells that doesn't have vesicles, but they rather actively uh, suppress it. Um, so we discover one of the first uh, uh, mechanism involving this process. So since it's a kind of a new idea, we decided to develop a little bit further. Um, so we want to ask whether this is true to other CNS barriers, for example, blood retina barrier, blood spinal cord barrier, and also uh, can transcytosis be dynamically modulated? Um, and then, of course, the most importantly, how does the mechanism, what is the mechanism underlying this? So I'm just going to show you one slide to, to summarize this and then spend a little bit of time to tell you about the mechanism. Um, so uh, we chose to just to study development. We're not doing any perturbation or anything, just to observe, right? So what we found is that, interestingly, when the blood vessels first enter the brain, um, so they're just like a periphery in the cellular cells, that they're actually leaky. Um, and then, no surprise, you saw a lot of vesicles. However, to our surprise, even that early stage, they already have the specialized tight junctions, fully functional. And then uh, in the uh, following few days, those vesicles are gradually trimmed away. Only once completely surprised, the uh, berry become uh, tight and, and functional. So um, this just highlights the importance of the mechanism of suppression transcytosis for the barrier function. Um, so what is the mechanism? Um, so um, we look at the MFC2A, and it's a, it's a great molecular handle. Um, so there's an immuno EM showing its expression actually on the uh, luminal side, mainly on the luminal side of the membrane, um, sometimes associated with vesicle, uh, like here, uh, but it's definitely absent in the tight junctions. And uh, we um, also considered what type of vesicles are actually involved. Uh, some of them you probably know, like clathin coated ones are well known. But actually what we discovered is that is the um, cavioli vesicles are downstream of the uh, MFC2A. So cavioli vesicles are small um, plasma membrane vagination. Um, the key molecule ca called the cavioli one is obligated uh, protein. Without this protein, you wouldn't have cavioli vesicles. Um, this has become important. Um, so. Um, here is a um, immuno EM of cavioli one showing the uh, cavioli vesicle decorated by cavioli one um, in the MFC2A mutant mice. Um, we demonstrate that MFC2A suppressed transcytosis by blocking the cavioli formation. Um, you know, just to remind you, um, we see the increase of vesicles uh, in the mutant mouse. Um, I highlight here for you, and this phenotype is completely rescued. Uh, in double mutant mice, MSC2A Kava uh, mutant mice, Kava mutant mice doesn't have cavioli vesicle anymore. And to mirror, uh, mer uh, mirror um, this uh, result, we also see this leakage phenotype uh, completely rescued in the double mutant mice. So this experiment told us that the, indeed this upregulation of the um, cavioli vesicles accounts for this leakage phenotype. So normally MFC2A uh, suppress the formation. So this is a more direct evidence. Recently we made a new mouse, which is to ectopically express MSC2A uh, under the control of Cray. Uh, so for example, here is a endothelial cells that normally don't have MSC2A, have a lot of cavioli vesicles. When we specifically reintroduce MSC2A, you can see those vesicles are uh, dramatically reduced. Um, okay, so um, so, so far, you know, um, we, we demonstrate that MFC2A can uh, inhibit the formation of the cavioli vesicle. So how does it happen? You can imagine many possibilities, right? You could physically interact with cavioli pathways through some kind of uh, adapters. Um, so we, we can go on and on. As we're kind of uh, thinking about where to begin, um, there's papers, our companion paper actually published, um, and um, uh, David Silver's group demonstrate that the uh, MF2 is a transporter for the uh, essential omega-3 fatty acid uh, DHA. Um, and later, I also found um, the uh, human homolog 
uh, of MMC2A also expressed in the brain lithidial cells um, with a point mutation naturally happening in human, which um, are um, um, lack of the capability to um, transport the lipid, and as a result, that they have a microcephaly in those patients. And by the way, our knockout mice also have microcephaly. So it seems like these two things are not really related. Um, um, basically, you know, it's a lipid transporter, but it's also involving the transcytosis. Um, but we wanted to know definitively whether these two things are linked or not. So we decided to uh, make a new mouse, uh, which is to take advantage of the fact that the transporter is a syn port. In order to bind to the lipid, you have to first uh, bind to sodium. Um, and then the side is, a, is a conserved among all the species. It's a single uh, amino acid. So we just mutate this one amino acid uh, and make a point mutation mouse. It's now kin mouse, basically just one amino acid change um, here. And um, um, so here, just to show you, this one amino acid change indeed is a um, transport, lipid transport dead mutant. So basically, here's the lipidomics analysis. You can see this, uh, uh, this, uh, this is the full knockout, this is the single knockout there, lipid profile completely track along each other. Okay, so what, the pheno what is the phenotype? Um, so to our surprise, actually, the phenotype is completely mimic the full knockout, even though it's just one amino acid change. Uh, so here's the increase of uh, transcytosis, um, again, normal junction, and then here's the vesicle uh, containing the tracers, and here's the leak cage. Um, so that means, um, basically, um, perhaps maybe the lipid itself play a role because this is really pinpoint one function. Um, so um, basically, it turned out to be, um, this is not a total crazy idea. Um, in fact, in vitro cell, cell culture type of experiment, um, it has been shown that the um, um, the um, caviolis usually tend to be resides in a very structured lipid uh, by layer, uh, which enriched in cholesterol, very organized uh, uh, structure versus uh, unsaturated fatty acid like DHA. Uh, here, you know, they have this this kicking leg, uh, make the uh, lipid layer much more fluid, and this is two part of the lipid mutually exclusive. So you can imagine when the membrane is uh, loaded with the DHA, then this will be displaced. Um, so um, if this is indeed the mechanism, then we would expect if we unbiasedly just do a lipidomic analysis from the endothelial cells of the, uh, from the um, brain versus the lung, you know, here's now the transcriptional analysis anymore, this is the lipidomics, uh, we should see a dramatic difference. And indeed, that's what we saw, and this is really pleasantly surprised because most of them are same, but, you know, all the red dots are indeed DHA-containing phospholipid. So this is really striking, it means the fundamental difference, actually, at least the DHA-containing phospholipid is one of them. Um, so just to summarize, uh, using MS2A, we learn at least one mechanism, how um, bringing the thelial cells can actively uh, suppress the, um, the vesicles. So in the long, in the periphery, um, you don't have this MS2A, you can freely form the cavioli vesicles, and in a snapshot EM, you see a lot of those vesicles. In contrast, because of unique expression of MS2A only in the uh, seen as endothelial cells, they um, change the lipid uh, composition, which as a result actively suppress the cavioli formation. So when you do a snapshot, you actually see a very little amount of those vesicles. Okay, so clearly, uh, this is just work uh, as a proof of principle. Um, so we learned not only biologically a new concept that transcytosis may be involved in a major mechanism regulating dormant barrier, also from therapeutic point of view, um, you can imagine if you uh, can inhibit those inhibitors, then you can reopen the barrier. So we're actually uh, currently making functional blocking antibodies of MFC2A and, and testing this idea. Um, but more importantly, um, you know, as I mentioned, we, we have another 300 genes. What are all the other genes are doing? How they work together to, as an ensemble to regulate the barrier? So we're actively working on that. Um, so far, we uh, test the first 14 uh, candidate, and uh, um, we found seven of them have, have leakage phenotypes. So here's a wild type case, you, you know, the entire brain, you never see leakage. Um, and then there's a, some is really severe leakage, and some of them is more mild. 
um, and uh, ongoing work kind of, uh, um, kind of indicate that uh, besides the Cavioli pathways, we actually see other pathways also uh, regulating the transcytosis pathway. So um, I think um, the idea is that down the road we're going to harness all those uh, knowledge we learn uh, finally in the position to be able to open and tighten the barrier. Uh, so for the rest of few minutes, I'm going to just to uh, tell you about our ideas and the preliminary data of uh, the role of a uh, BBB uh, in the contact with neuroimmune uh, signaling. Um, the reason, uh, I think throughout the talk, um, you, you are, I don't have to convince you that it's, it's uh, well accepted throughout the life, your body, your peripheral tissue constantly get in, uh, installed, um, receiving um, infections, your or different type of virus infection, bacterial infection. So those um, things accumulatively, you know, all kinds of factors are uh, floating around in, in your circulation, right? And then we also know that uh, it, th this indeed have an impact in the brain side, in the brain parenchyma, right? Like microglia activation, many labs have shown that. Uh, but the mystery is that it's kind of a black box sitting in between them is exactly the blood brain barrier, the, blood brain, uh, the endothelial cells. Um, so I think um, we would like to understand, um, so the, the two major questions are, uh, one, um, you know, how, um, how are the signals from the periphery um, here, right, to, um, you know, to receive and to be received and transmitted at the blood-brain barrier um, so that you have an impact in the, on the other side of the brain. And also, um, during our work of uh, study blood-brain barrier, we also realized that uh, there's a heterogeneity in the brain. There are seven areas in the brain actually don't have intact the blood-brain barrier, purposely have a leaky barrier so that they can quickly access what's going on in the circulation. And then we're wondering whether those particular areas, uh, so are there specialized regions in the brain that receive direct information about the periphery immune status? So your brain constantly aware of what's going on. So I'm just to give you an example how we're going to study the first question. So the idea is that, um, I think Tony also alluded yesterday, um, is that we think um, you know, the periphery uh, signals in the bloodstream probably can be sensed by the first, right, by the endothelial cells, and they can uh, then integrate those uh, um, sensory information um, in a way uh, that can then um, release signals to impact on the uh, CNS side. So to study this, we think it's really important to first map out the temporal profile of the information flow, A to B to, to C, right? Because when the things are op very open, everything becomes a mess. You don't know what is a chicken, what is egg. So I think, um, you know, to simplify this process, I think it's really important to, for example, first to map out the time window of the periphery uh, immune response, right? And presumably the second wave of event will be at the BBB, um, the endothelial cells, uh, how they respond to this. And then, then later stages about the seen as you know, microglia or neurons, what they're um, what happening to them. And then you can imagine at that stage, probably those signals give back to the endothelial cells and the endothelial cells will change again. Maybe that time you see the very opening or something. But we're not interested in studying this phase. I think we really want to study the early uh, beginning uh, event and really understand what is the trigger of this whole event. So I think mapping out is really important. Um, so um, to do that, you know, for example, we use a simple paradigm of PS and you can see um, here's some timeline for the reduce of weight loss and here's measure the blood TNF level, I mean, less than just a few hours, you can see a dramatic increase. It's just like four hours, you already see a dramatic increase of the uh, immune response. So, so this at least, I'm not an immunologist, I, I was really stunned by how fast this is. Um, and then importantly, at this dose, uh, at 48 hours, we actually see um, the uh, microglia activation uh, like everyone else reported. So we know, you know, there's uh, something in between we're continuing to narrow down. but. This is actually a surprising result. Even though we saw the microglia activation, um, we actually see the um, barriers are completely intact. They're not open. Um, in the literature, I think a lot of reports saying LPI treatment, the leakage. So I, I'm glad at least in this dose at this time is not because we actually don't want to enter this phase because things will become much more complicated. Um, so I think this is the idea where uh, after we um, 
define this earliest event, and we're going to use um, single uh, cell RNA seq approach. My lab already established um, while we're studying the blood barrier. Um, so then we're also capable to um, to identify and bias the endothelial cells, including the subtypes, the capillary, arterial, and and everything par uh, parasite. Um, so then the idea is then combination with the uh, loss of function, gain of function, genetic cell type specific approach, we'll, we'll finally in the position to to answer what's going on in, in, the, in, the, in the middle part of the phase to connect uh, the periphery and the central uh, nervous system, uh, the neuroimmune interaction. So hopefully in the future I can report back to you. Um, so here I just want to acknowledge people have done the work. Um, so the blood and berry work was uh, uh, done by uh, two formal Postdoc Ayao and Baptista both have their lab now, and also uh, later joined by two now as a former graduate student. Um, and uh, the the new target are uh, studied by Shaho and other uh, students. Um, the single cell RNA seq work is done by Sarah, a postdoc, and then uh, Ryan just joined the lab, who's actually an immunology student. Uh, in light of this grant, you know, I started to track those people uh, and did all those uh, preliminary work on the, on the uh, LPS and infection. And here's the uh, funding agency, and particularly thank you for the um, Pi Frontier Group. Thanks. <laughs>